I don't know. It does, it does not honor the divisions right. between the rights of human beings right. and the rights of citizens. Right. Well, this document doesn't deal with it. I will, I will find out the legislative history, Alex. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I know that it wasn't acceptable. I know when, they, when people raised it with the Constitution, it went nowhere. But I'll find out the, draft, the, the, the legislative history of that. And I'll report to you guys next time. OK, so it's a chit. I owe you the, history, the legislative history. But, but it was the case, as you all know, we've done American history. That the, all the major founding fathers were, conf were, conf were, none of them were defenders of slavery. You can't be an enlightenment person and defend slavery per se. All you can say is, look, um, this is the foundation of the American, if we're going to have a country, we're going to have, we're going to, and as you know, solving the issue of slavery ended up in a civil war. I mean, and that wasn't the end of it either with the 14th Amendment. I mean, this is, this is the great American story, um, right? Uh, and we're still struggling with it. Um, but I will find out the legislative, this, this shift in the, in the, I mean, I put this, I should have done this. It's bad of me to put this in the reader and not, all right. It's not the, it's not the breastfeeding time yet. Wrong for my sins. Um, all right, so let me now go briefly to just, uh, to a criticism of these reviews and, and uh, uh, the responses. And all of these criticisms are ones we're going to come back to. So I just want to give you a sketch to let you know that I'm, I'm on the case that you pointed out. Number one is that Rorty is simply wrong. This, this is an era of moral progress. In fact, it may be a era of not moral progress. And since the Second World War, there's an argument to be made that in many of these arenas, things are getting worse and not, and not, and, and not uh, uh, better. The second point to be made is that the capacity to know the feeling of someone else is not necessarily to lead to feeling with them in a good way, it could also lead to feeling with them in a bad way. That is to say, to understand what another person feels like might also be a way to torture the person better. And there is certainly, um, and to understand what it is to be humiliated is to be able to humiliate the person. So in that sense, I agree. It's not a, this is not um, a, a formula um, for, uh, for right action. The third point that's constantly brought up from the beginning of humanitarian to the present is hypocrisy. You care for people at a distance, you don't care for people at home. That's the, the standard uh, version of this. Your interest in humanitarianism only for self-interest. It's good for your soul, and it happens to be good for the soul of others. The fourth point, that it does more harm than good, and this is a common version in, very, in modern humanitarianism, that feelings trump reason. So the great example of this, and we'll come back to at the end of the course to these sorts of criticism, is in, is in, uh, is in Somalia, where human rights organi humanitarian organizations are paying warlords for the privilege of sending food to starving people. Um, the warlords take 60 or 70 percent of this, of this, of this uh, use it to buy weapons, which just makes it worse. And in fact, they keep the civil war going and keep certain people in suffering precisely, because if they didn't, um, there wouldn't be this humanitarian uh, uh, milk cow from which to get from which to get uh, um, which to get money. So the humanitarians not only don't help, they make it worse by giving people an incentive to do bad things. Now that's true in Somalia, and it led to a real uh, um, burst of self-criticism and 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 uh, reflection on the part of humanitarian organizations. But I want to suggest to you that humanitarian organizations have always, in some sense, been reflexive. They understand that an intervention could be, could have negative consequences. So yes, I agree, it's not a panacea. I disagree that it, because it's not a panacea, because it can lead to these bad things, and because it can be hypocritical, doesn't mean that it can't be engaged in a, sensibly, in a sensible political way. And I think the anti-slavery movement is such a movement. Now, let me end with the following, uh, with the following point. And I'll let you study this quote, it's from a really quite brilliant law review article by a guy named Robert Cover at Yale. But briefly, what Cover argues, and what, what, what I want to suggest to you, um, is that you don't need just feelings, and you don't need just laws um, um, uh, or, or norms. The two I want to suggest are mutually, um, are mutually uh, constitutive. Um, every narrative, the kind of is insistent in its demands for, for, um, 
for a prescriptive point. You ought to be doing something. So you have a narrative. It tells you you ought to be doing something. And every prescription, every law, is insistent in its demand to be located in a discourse, in a narrative. In other words, you have laws because they, because they um, tell there's some, some story that you want to write. So laws on the one hand, which make you do something, and narratives and discourses on the other, which make you feel you ought to be doing something, exist in mutual relationship to one another. So law, or reason in itself, a norm is not enough to make people. And feeling, or a narrative story that makes you feel bad about something, is not enough either. So the two are connected. And I think what you're going to see in the history of the course as we, as we, as we, as we move along is that this is the case, that narratives of the sort I've been talking to you about push laws for the making of laws, national and international. And these laws and these international, whether they're always debated is a second question, push people um, to create certain narratives about them to bring certain narratives about them in this sort of circle. So, um, so that's, that's, the, that's the main conclusion. The other conclusion I wanted you to think about is that these books that were, these books of examples that you read and the pictures you look at are in a way that you could think of as a sort of slow looking or attentive looking or attentive engagement. So I want to say it's an insistent regard to the work of art um, not so much the work, but to, the, to, a, to a person and, 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 to the, and the particularity of that person. So that's why in the course, I'm gonna, we're going to see a lot of movie and movie clips in the second half of the course. I'm going to read a lot of novels, and we're going to talk to filmmakers who are engaged in this, because just exactly it's because these people are trying to imagine ways in which they're going to make you look at something and pay attention to this long enough to think that this is something you should be doing something about. And furthermore, it either fits into a legal obligation to do something, or it ought to fit into a legal obligation to do something which you guys ought to be engaged with. So the form of the narrative and the form of law are, 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 are connected. And that explains why in this course, we do probably more than you would in most human rights courses with these aesthetic, um, in its broad sense, um, uh, these forms. So next time, back to politics, we're going to talk about humanitarian interventions in the, in the 19th century. Thanks.